This episode brought to you by Honey, the easiest way to save money when you're shopping online. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it, so you don't have to. Sorry if I look a little disheveled right now, but did you hear how this did recently? Did you hear what the next few films from Disney are gonna be? Aren't you excited? Most everyone I know is sick of the Disney live-action remakes. Even those who like them are getting tired of them. We've gone from one maybe every four or five years to one every year to several every year. And there's even more on the way. It wouldn't be too bad if there was more variation in their work, but the more they make, the less they try something different. Even giving us what feels like a shot-for-shot, -shot, line for line redo of a beloved classic. Disney used to be so cool, I hear people say. Why are we being given the same thing over and over? Well, the short answer is... <coughs> But the long answer may be a bit more complicated. And in order to understand it, we first have to understand the company that puts them out. Disney is a cultural phenomenon. I think safe to say, unlike anything the world has ever seen. Don't get me wrong, the world has seen fairy tales and amusement parks and technological advances, but to my memory, there is no entertainment company centered around families that is as massive or recognizable on the planet. I can take three identical circles, put them together, and most people would know that means Mickey Mouse. Just from three circles. Think about that! It doesn't even look like a mouse, but most people recognize it as that because of this company. And the fact that a lot of this long-lasting empire is based on stories that both children and adults can relate to is beyond impressive. Think of other studios, directors, producers. They've made many stories that'll stay with people too, but most would agree Disney not only has the highest number of stories that stay with us, but they're the most frequent in putting them out. When you think about it, it's brilliant. You take something that people already know or relate to, like say, fairy tales, put your own unique touches on it, and suddenly everyone thinks your version. It's hard for a child to hear the name Snow White and not imagine that she looks like this. If comic books are modern-day Greek mythology, as some people have declared, then Disney is modern-day fairy tales. And from that, they spawn new ideas, new technologies, new imaginative ways to entertain everyone. And that's the key word, everyone. Mark Twain used to describe his work as water. Many people drink wine, he says, but everyone drinks water. Disney clearly has that same mindset. It not only works from an entertainment perspective, but from a business perspective as well. But that's the thing about show business. It is show and business. People now see Snow White as a masterpiece, but back then, it was a huge gamble. Threatening to destroy Disney Studios if it didn't turn in big bucks. Thankfully it did though, as well as made history. But after that, their following films, Fantasia, Dumbo, Pinocchio, and Bambi, did not turn in the profit they were hoping for. In fact, they rarely turned in a profit. We know them as classics today, but back then they weren't really seen as big money makers, at least nowhere near what Snow White was, so they were hurting business. On top of that, war. Most businesses were hurting because of it, and Disney was no exception. The films they were putting out at this time were a collection of shorts because they couldn't afford to put out one completed story. They just kind of combined the stories that they started before the war broke out and said, here you go, this is a movie now. When the war ended, though, they finally had breathing room to do complete movies. What did they do? I think it's fitting to say they made another Snow White. Now, don't get me wrong, I like Cinderella a lot. In fact, it was one of Walt's favorites. But if you were to say which of their past completed motion pictures was it like, it's clearly Snow White. And from here, Disney would take risks in other departments, but not really in their animated features. They've just gone through too many shaky times, and they needed to stay afloat. Not to say they didn't put out top-notch quality work, I mean, I love a lot of these movies. 
but where their first five films stylistically were very little alike, now every animated film following would have to be like one of those five. Again, not an awful thing as many of these films were great, but what I'm getting at is pushing the envelope in terms of originality had slowed down. Because that's what made sense from the business side. Give the people what they know they like. Sound familiar? It's no secret Disney has gone through slumps over the years, and will happily put out lesser material if it's deemed popular. It seems like the recent Disney remakes, as well as the recent Disney sequels, are either their way out of some sort of financial muck, or a way to make even more profit to venture into other, pray to God, creative avenues. While it seems similar to what Disney has done in the past, the remakes do seem... off a little. Now the idea of remakes is nothing that crazy. Back in the early days of cinema, giant epics were remade when they went from silent films to talkies. Movies like Ben-Hur, Ten Commandments, and even Zorro were remade with sound, sometimes even by the same director. This was more than just doing the exact same thing, though. While they followed the initial story and characters, the dialogue, style, and performances were noticeably different. They were great stories that deserved great updates. For a while, that's what Disney seemed to do with their remakes. Yeah, kinda. The first remake of The Jungle Book had little to do with either the book or the Disney film, and was pretty silly. Uh, aside from the horrifying deaths that still haunt my childhood memories. Jesus Christ! Films like 101 Dalmatians brought in a pretty penny, and, though not great, was more fitting of what a remake should be. Follows the same initial story, but had enough differences to be its own thing. Like the animals not talking, more focus on the people, and the goddamn craziest Glenn Close performance since she played a pirate in Hook. Yeah, her IMDb is weird. As you can see though, these remakes are few and far between. They did well, but seemingly not enough to repeat over and over and over. A lot of people say the official live-action Disney remake fad started with Alice in Wonderland. Well, you can certainly say this one didn't just copy the original, to a goddamn fault! Like many of these remakes, I've reviewed this movie in the past and confirmed the barrel of dick that it is, so you can find out more by watching those. But even though it sucked the big one, it didn't matter. Because this film was a hit. A big hit. But Disney had to figure out what was a hit about it. Did audiences like the elements similar to the original, or did they like the elements that were different? Well, four years after Alice was released, Disney started budgeting their money to make even more to find out. If they liked Alice as the exact opposite of what she was, maybe doing the same for the villain in Sleeping Beauty would work. If they enjoyed more the original simplicity of the story, perhaps Cinderella being more faithful would win them over. Much to their delight, they both did well. So now we can have a totally different Dumbo where none of the animals talk, or we can have a scene-by-scene -scene retelling of Beauty and the Beast. Except, you know, moved around. Now we can submit it for Best Picture of the Year? Oh yeah, Disney tried that. Good friggin' God! Bottom line, unlike before where there needed to be some changes made to a remake to make it interesting, Disney discovered it wasn't totally required. So now these films could be made a lot faster, because the story and characters were already set. And if anything, the fewer changes made, the better. Thus we went from one, maybe two a year, to five. At the same time when people were noticing this fad growing, Pixar was putting out even more sequels than before. This couldn't be a coincidence. Chances are, Disney was desperate for stability. Whether to make up for lost costs or conquer other endeavors, I don't know. But what I do know is, as of now, these are definitely stable. But while their business history clearly shows why they would want this stability, the question remains, why is it stable? Why do so many people go back to these and keep making them hits? The films they've done in the past have certainly had similarities, but they were still different movies. We're now getting shot-for-shot -shot remakes and plenty of audiences are totally okay with it. What's the secret? What are we missing? Well, I have the secret to the Disney live-action remakes, and as long as it doesn't go dark and I accidentally lose it, I'm gonna make millions! Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, right now, perfect. And now, an interpretive dance about honey. So I guess it's not really that interpretive. Honey. Honestly, before I found out about honey, seeing the promo code box at checkout just stressed me out. Like, 
Should I be typing something in there? Is there a code? Just knowing that there could be a discount out there made me worry about overpaying every time I shopped online. Oh, thankfully now I have Honey. It's a free browser extension that scans the internet for coupon codes. Then, like magic, it automatically applies the best one to your cart at checkout. Honey will find you every coupon code, sale, or discount on over 20,000 sites like Amazon, eBay, Best Buy, GameStop, Newegg, and more! So you might ask, how do I know Honey really works? Well, not only did Honey test over 1 billion promo codes last year, but it actually applied... Oh, that's a big number. I don't want to say it. I'm just going to post it. Working codes to people's orders. Not to mention their subscribers who have already downloaded Honey have saved over $83,000. Wow, that's dot 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 a lot of real life savings. With Honey, there's literally no stress when you see their promo code box at checkout. I actually use Honey all the time whenever I buy products online. Look, I saved almost $4 getting Battle Angel Alita. It's basically free money. It works super fast, super efficient, and saves me super amounts of money. Save money with Honey. Just install Honey by going to joinhoney.com slash nostalgia. Honey is for everyone because it works for practically anything you buy online. And downloading is easy. It only takes two clicks to install. Look, there's really no reason not to download Honey. It's free to use, easy to install on your computer in just two clicks. Never overthink about the promo code box again. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash nostalgia. That's joinhoney.com slash nostalgia. Thanks again to Honey for sponsoring this video. Well, shit, I guess I have to speculate. While everyone is getting sick of these remakes, millions still go to see them and make them tons and tons of money. What are the reasons? Well, in my opinion, it comes down to four factors. One, nostalgia. No shit! Yeah, pretty obvious. But like I said before, Disney has done a brilliant job making sure their characters always stay with you. So even seeing a person in a costume at a theme park can make you feel the warm fuzzy wuzzies. Even seeing the trailers for these films gets so many people in the feels because they connected so much to their childhood and what arguably played a major part in developing their ethical and imaginative sides. So now these characters have returned and you can go back to feeling like a kid again when things were simpler and therefore presumably happier. You associate it with seeing an old friend. Look at that old friend. He hasn't changed at all. Like, at all. My god, you grew up so much and he didn't. He's still stuck in the past doing the exact same thing. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? That's so freaking sad! Uh, I mean, the stuff that's still good about him is good. Right? I think? This brings me to number two. The name is associated with quality. How many versions of Cinderella have been told in the past? Hundreds, maybe even thousands, but this Cinderella is easily the best known. And if that's the best known, clearly it must be the best, right? I mean, McDonald's is one of the best known restaurants in the world, and nothing beats that, right? Oh God, is that a chicken head? You probably caught on that just because something is popular doesn't always mean it's great, but it does still mean a lot of people like it, and there has to be a reason why. Let's say you thought the original Beauty and the Beast was just okay. You'd probably hear over and over how a lot of people say it touched their childhoods. Both kids and adults dress up as the characters, and even shirts and merchandise are bought because they want to celebrate how much they love them. It's likely that even though you may not necessarily be won over by all this, you would have to acknowledge there's something that's winning people over, and maybe it's worth taking another look. One of the Disney remakes that was not a financial hit was Pete's Dragon. And I think a big part of that was, it wasn't a strong enough property. I'm sure it has its fans, but while a decent amount know what Pete's Dragon is, everybody knows what Beauty and the Beast is. A while ago I did an editorial about movie parodies being dead, where I discussed how satire films were doing less mocking of popular movies and more displaying the fact that they know they're popular. When people saw all these big movies at the same time being mocked in one film, they assumed there would be good writing that lampooned them. 
because the writers of these movies rarely even saw the films they were satirizing. Rather, they just saw production photos and went off of that. Regardless, for a while, people went to see them because they thought they would be the same quality as, say, Airplane or Spaceballs, by the simple act of showing something they recognized in it. Disney remakes are essentially the same thing. It doesn't matter if their motivations make no sense or if the acting is off, because you already connected to the original. You're filling in the blanks the movie is leaving vacant because it was so hastily written. Simba and Nala clearly have no chemistry in the new Lion King, but you think they do because you remember when they did in the original. Same thing with Beauty and the Beast. Your nostalgia is filling in what's missing. If they trick everyone to seeing the movie at least once, they've already made a profit. And the thing is, people want to believe something they cherished as a child is still good. So they're willing to put up with the faults of the remakes because they still recognize it with something positive in their lives. It doesn't have to be good, it just has to make you feel good. The third reason is kind of a weird one, but I do think it plays a big part here. Kids like seeing something that makes them feel grown up. I remember when I was a kid, I was excited to see the new Batman, because the only movies I had prior were Adam West and Scooby-Doo. I remember going crazy when I found out there was a live-action Ghostbusters based on my favorite Saturday morning cartoon. I mean, okay, the movie wasn't based on the cartoon, it was the other way around, but I didn't know that at the time, or cared. I felt older watching it, that they did grown-up things like drink and smoke and swear and get ghost BJs, it was weird. It was awesome to be watching something that adults enjoyed. It made you feel cooler and smarter. I even remember being excited for the new Super Mario Brothers movie. I didn't care that it looked nothing like the original because I thought this was gonna be like Batman and Ghostbusters, more adult and gritty. And it was... Monkey! Not. Regardless, it got me to buy a ticket. Yet the film was so far removed from what the original was and had so little quality, I couldn't enjoy it. These films are varying less and less from the original. So to a kid, it must be good because it's like that thing you loved only done in real life. There's a reason they call it the live action Lion King and not the CG one. Kids want to feel like they're seeing something more adult, and it's obviously working. The fourth and final reason I think you can associate to a lot of things in entertainment, people like updates. Now keep in mind an update is very different from a stylistic change. In Return of the Jedi, switching out a song is a stylistic change. You could have kept it and people would have been fine. But fixing the flying effects is an update. People would be more open because it looked really bad in the original. It's essentially showing what it was meant to look like. And I know, don't touch it, preserve a classic and everything. I'm talking about changes though that anybody would make when needing to update something. The Disney remakes, to their credit, do a lot of that. Aladdin is set in Arabia. It makes sense that the actors look and sound more like this than the cast of Full House. Some cliches that were seen as sexist or racist could be taken out. Again, kinda to a fault, where the more they try to push an agenda, the more it backfires and makes the character either more boring or, ironically, more damaging. It's also nice to see modern actors you've grown up with in these parts. Not to say at all the originals were bad in the least, but in their day they were big names that everyone knew, so you could be excited to see them in a role. Recasting them with other big name celebs is another way to relive that excitement of seeing a performer you recognize and enjoy take on a part you recognize and enjoy. Kids don't know who Louis Prima or George Sanders are, but they definitely know who Will Smith and Emma Watson are. So it allows them to get excited for someone they know playing a role the same way audiences in the past got excited to see someone they know in a role. I guess when you think about it, it is a perfect plan. You could argue there's actually more to draw audiences in nowadays than not, as nostalgia is still a big part of our society and Disney has been cashing in on it for quite some time now. But here's the thing, a lot of people are comparing these to the Disney straight-to-DVD sequels that came out a long time ago. Where are they now? We know they exist, but we don't really connect them that strongly to the original. Is Mulan ruined for everyone because of Mulan 2? Are people going to stop seeing Fox and the Hound because its sequel was so bad? No, people still love the originals and the sequels half the time are barely even remembered. My guess is the Disney live action remakes will probably be the same. They're big now, but it'll fade. And the originals will still be cherished long after these are forgotten. I mean, think about it. Snow White is over 80 years old. 
and she's still being watched and celebrated even today. Much like how we had to put up with Transformer films and Twilight films and even those god-awful parody movies, people will lose interest and they'll have to move on to something else. Pixar is finally releasing two original films not connected to any of their past ones, and there are a few movies not based on past Disney films coming out, so hopefully there can be some more creativity in the near future. But here's my thought. If you're gonna do these Disney live-action remakes anyway, take more chances with them, because people are gonna see them no matter what right now. I know the mindset. People like to see those side-by-side -side fan comparisons on YouTube, so we're gonna do the same thing. What you're missing is people do those for a short amount of time, not an entire movie. In fact, they tried it once with a shot-by-shot -shot remake of Psycho. It sucked. Hard. It sucked hard. I say do with these remakes the same thing Disney did with the original fairy tales. Everyone knew the story of Snow White and Cinderella, but Disney came along and made it uniquely theirs to a point where people see those versions as the definitive story. Nobody's gonna choose this Beauty and the Beast over this one, or this Lion King over that one. Because not only are they not better, they're not different. Well, okay, they're different in these ways. They lack passion, fresh ideas, and creative need to exist. You succeeded on that front. Walt Disney put his studio on the line to bring Snow White to the big screen. If it failed, he would have been in huge trouble. If these fail, you just have to find another way to make an easy buck. People can feel the difference both on screen and behind the scenes. You can't feel anyone half-assing it with Snow White. They made it because they wanted to give families something beautiful to hold on to. You're literally making the exact same thing for the exact wrong reasons, and sooner or later, it's going to run its course. So, if it's gonna happen anyway, bring something new and exciting to the screen. I hate the remake of Alice in Wonderland, but I give it credit that it is at least different. I'd rather watch that a million times than another screening of the remake of Lion King. Even the Disney DVD sequels had their little gems, like Lion King 2 or Cinderella 3. Movies that were clearly made just for money, but the makers chose to make the best of it. Bringing imagination, passion, and dare I say it, new elements to stories and characters we were already familiar with. There's a lot of people that like these movies, and for good reason. They're enjoyable and clever, and people can watch and enjoy them just as much now as when they first came out, where people are already getting sick of these. There's a big difference between Alastair's Sims Christmas Carol and the Smurfs Christmas Carol. Both are based on the same material, but one gave an intriguing, intelligent, and loving take on a classic story. Yet for some reason, you give it all the money to the Smurfs. It's not fair to those that really bring something new, something charming, something interesting to an already timeless story. I don't know what's next for Disney. I'm sure they'll find other gimmicks as well as new ideas to give birth to. All I'm saying is maybe we can encourage the best elements of something old with the best elements of something new to still get something special. That's what you used to be known for. Let's make you known for that again. Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. Hey, Doug Walker here. The Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is this week's charity shout out. This is the world's oldest and largest private cancer center. It has devoted more than 130 years to exceptional patient care, innovative research, and outstanding educational programs. Today, they are one of 50 national cancer institutes with state-of-the-art science flourishing side-by-side -side with clinical studies and treatments. The close collaboration between their physicians and scientists is one of their unique strengths, enabling them to provide patients with the best care available as they work to discover more effective strategies to prevent, control, and ultimately cure cancer in the future. Their education programs train future physicians and scientists, and the knowledge and experience they gain has an impact on cancer treatment and biomedical research around the world. Click on the link and see how you can help these people bring an end to one of the worst illnesses the world has ever known.